Um, I'm now going to pass it over to Daniela Levy Pinto of NELS, who's going to be moderating the multi stakeholder panel. Um, just a quick logistical note while she's going to moderate the panel, I'll help with the uh, the Q and A at the end. So please save your questions to the end, and then we'll 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 take them at that time. We'll ask you to probably raise your hand or put the questions in the chat, and then I'll I'll share them as we go through. Uh, so thanks everyone for being here, and Daniela, I'll pass it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Leah. Welcome everyone to the second day of our summit. I'm very excited to uh, moderate the panel. Uh, the multi-stakeholder panel. I will begin by introducing all our panelists and then uh, we'll briefly talk about the structure. Um, so all our panelists can speak about accessibility and inclusion uh, across the ecosystem, um, including book production, uh, publishing and creation, distribution, remediation, copyright and the Marrakesh Treaty, experience of the reader, metadata, and much more. So um, I'll begin introducing our panelists. Uh, first, we have Adam Wilton. Um, Adam is a program manager with the Accessible Resource Center BC and the Provincial Resource Center uh, for the Visually Impaired. His background is as a teacher for uh, uh, of the visual, visually impaired students and an orientation and mobility specialist. Hi, Adam. Um, Avnish Singh, uh, who heads strategy and operations at the DAISY Consortium and is a member of the advisory, group, uh, advisory board of the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, he has more than 15 years experience in developing um, of te uh, technology uh, for accessible publishing and reading and is a key driver of um, efforts for a wor uh, worldwide um, inclusive publishing ecosystem. Um, Avnish, thanks for being here. Thanks to the magic of the internet. Um, next, we have Nell's uh, very own Danny Faris. Uh, Danny works an, as an accessibility developer to design applications to make accessible publishing easier. Hi, Danny. Um, then we have uh, Laura Brady, the director uh, um, of cross media at Anansi and Roundwood. Uh, in addition to being a self-proclaimed accessibility busybody full-time. We're so happy to have you here, Laura. Um, then we have Noah Jenner. Noah is the leader at uh, BookNet Canada, where he orchestrates a skilled, um, sorry, a skilled team of technical um, and policy-oriented client-focused staff uh, to provide new data management services and supply chain. Um, solutions for uh, the Canadian Publishing Library and, um, uh, sorry, and retail sectors. Hi, Noah. And last but not least, we have Victoria Owen. Uh, Victoria is an information and policy scholar practitioner uh, in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, um, as well as chair of the uh, Canadian Federation of Library Associations Copyright Committee. Uh, Victoria is also on the board of the World, um, World Intellectual Property Organization Accessible Bo Books Consortium. Thank you for joining us, Victoria. And of course, uh, my name is Daniela Levy Pinto, and I am with Nels. So now for the structure of the panel, um, Everyone can speak uh, from, from their perspectives. Uh, the uh, panel section will last 45 minutes. There are um, a couple of questions, uh, more general questions for to hear from everyone. And some other questions are aimed for some panelists. But of course, everyone will have an opportunity to contribute. I, I suspect that much of the conversation will flow organically. Um, I, I am totally blind, so it will be a bit, uh, it may be a bit challenging uh, to read kind of faces via Zoom. Um, 
but I, I will also try to monitor the uh, raise hand function and uh, Leah will be uh, assisting with moderating the QA uh, for the chat. Um, so let's get started with the questions. And the first general question, um, from your perspective, what is the most important advance in accessible publishing in the last year? Um, let's start with Avnish. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> it's an honor to be with such a great panel here. <clears throat> Coming to the question, since we are, this session is, is mainly about the supply chain, looking from the global perspective, a couple of things which have real, which are really becoming a driver. I would like to name firstly the European Accessibility Act, the European Accessibility Directive, which will be applicable to all the products and services which will be sold in Europe from 2025. And member states have to implement the law before June 2022. The great thing is that it is not only applicable to the European publishing industry, but to everyone who wants to sell their publications or the products in Europe. And what sets it apart is that it is, it is not only focused on the content, it is focused on different parts of the supply chain. It obviously on the eBooks, it is also focused on the websites of the seller. It also focuses on the metadata, also on the support services provided by the industry and also on the e-readers. So it provides the functional requirements for all the different nodes of the supply chain. Apart from this, I think the, the Canadian government's initiative of supporting the inclusive publishing industry is also one of the big motivator. I think these are the two big motivators of last one or one and a half year, years. And at the beginning of, of this millennium, these two things have put the momentum really for the accessibility and the inclusive publishing. Thank you. Thank you, Avnish. And absolutely, uh, that's, a, that's a great way to start thinking about um, all this and how it will have an impact. Um, uh, at, uh, Laura, would you like to uh, offer your perspective? Happy to. Um, I would also like to say I'm really delighted to be here and to see such a dream team of big brains working on um, the issues at play in the in these few days of conversation. It's really such a treat to be able to contribute and to listen in on what's happening. Um, following up on what Evanish just said, I would say that the, one of the key things, you know, we're all doing our work, making our ebooks as accessible as possible, working on the tools, working on education, working on helping publishers. But the key piece of the puzzle, in my opinion, is the metadata and the link to exposing that metadata to vendors. And there's been a lot of work on that in the past year. And we're really getting close to making these books that we work so hard on more discoverable by the people who need access to the metadata that describes them. It feels to me like that is a key piece and there's been tons of progress and it's really nice to see. Um, and, and a lot of that progress wouldn't be possible with some of this um, Department of Canadian Heritage money, but it is happening in various places all around the world, including in Avnisha's Accessibility Tax Task Force, which is a part of the W3C's EPUB working group. Um, there's a lot of work going on in various places, and it's great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Noah. Thanks, Daniela. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think I, I'll pick up, pick up on a couple of things that other people have already uh, touched on, but I think they're really, really important, and I just uh, I think it's worth stressing them. Um, you know, obviously, BookNet's really interested in this metadata, metadata and discoverability piece, and really think that that's important for driving um, the whole supply chain for accessible accessible uh, books. And so we're really interested in that. I think some things happened this year, um, both in the accessibility space itself, and then externally that are going to impact, hopefully in a good way going forward, uh, the accessibility. Um, 
I know that a few people that are here today were on an, a BISG, that's the US standards body uh, call last week, uh, where Charles uh, Lapierre shared um, a document on how reading systems, uh, discoverability platforms, more discoverability platforms, and e-commerce platforms can expose metadata. I thought it was a great document. It's the first time I'd seen that document. It's something we've been working on a long, long time. So picking up where Laura was just going, I think, and Avish was, was talking about, um, you know, getting this stuff now at the forefront of the consumer's mind is one thing, uh, is really, really important. The consumer and reader mind is huge, hugely important so that we can take advantage of all the hard work that people are doing. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the pandemic uh, that we're currently going through and the impact it's having on our supply chains and our consumer behavior and our reader behavior uh, is hugely, hugely important. And perhaps um, not just in negative ways, but in positive ways too. Uh, we've seen a refocus by a lot of publishers and supply chain back on digital a little bit. Um, because we saw digital consumption grow dramatically over the last year because in North America and in Canada specifically, uh, stores and libraries were often closed uh, for physical acquisition of materials. And so digital material jumped to the fore again. And this maybe gives us a focus back on digital uh, that never really completely left, but an investment, uh, a path to an investment in digital that could include accessibility as a huge component of it. So I think that that's a huge part of this as well. Wonderful, thank you, Noah. And uh, yeah, there's there's lots uh, lots to uh, unpack there, and uh, certainly the pandemic has had an interesting uh, impact and uh, to to continue uh, to be explored. Um, Denny, would you like to offer your perspective? Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, everyone, and it, it really is an honor to be here. So, thank you for inviting me. As we uh, work with various publishers across Canada, uh, we have a chance to see um, firsthand what uh, publishers are producing these days and, and what their books look like as they're going to uh, production and distribution. And one of the things that struck me over this past year is the adoption of EPUB 3. Uh, so many of the publishers and even several that we worked with in the past have moved to producing uh, EPUB 3. And not just that, but they're actually starting to uh, adopt the accessibility features that we've been uh, recommending in our work. Um, they're including semantic vocabulary, for instance, and uh, even accessibility metadata in many cases. So that's been really exciting for me to see uh, as we look at individual files from individual publishers and, and just looking at the reports that we're producing and congratulating them on really adopting a lot of this stuff that has taken a long time uh, because of the workflow the publishers uh, have and the, the timelines that they operate under. But it is so neat to see that starting to come. So that's been really exciting for me to see. Thank you, Danny. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Victoria, what's your perspective here? Well, thank you very much. And I too am delighted to be here and so happy to see uh, so many uh, old friends and to meet new people um, who are involved in this. And I really want to join Laura Brady's group of accessible busybodies. I think it's a great, it's a great time. <laughs> Everybody's welcome. So I, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the Canada Book Fund is one of the things that stands out to me as a real uh, great boon uh, this, this year. I think it's, uh, it bring, makes accessible publishing um, you know, so important, it brings it to the fore. It makes you realize that, you know, government, the government of Canada and the taxpayers really are behind, are supporting this. And the money is being spent to, sub, to support Canadian publishers and to get our, you know, Can this Canadian story made accessible. Uh, so I think that is really, to me, one of the top uh, things for the, in the past year. I agree with Avnish too, the EU Accessibility Directive is also a powerful uh, initiative and will drive um, certainly a lot of uh, a lot a big move over to accessible publishing. It's um, and the the other thing that we're working on is not the publishing; it's tangential to publishing because we're I'm associated with libraries. Is the whole work on metadata? So getting that sorted out so uh, we can the discoverability happens. 
and um, and and the standard we we establish those standards so that everybody uh, describes their materials in the same way so that it's really much more interoperable. So I think those are are some really great initiatives that I think are advancing very well um, in their own in their own their own time scale because work on standards everybody knows that it's it's a slow process but so important. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Victoria, and uh, absolutely. Uh, all the hard work for accessible publishing has to be discovered, and uh, that's that's instrumental. So uh, please keep uh, those conversations happening, and uh, it is it is very exciting work uh, to see. It's Adam, um, and delighted to join you all today from the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Salitooth, and Coast Salish peoples here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I just wanted to start by by saying that you know it's uh, the, and to kind of build no on what you mentioned around the pandemic um, we have seen and I know it's almost cliche at this point to mention silver linings um, to to what we've experienced but in the k-12 sector uh, something um, that we've noticed is a uh, a just a general uh, increase of awareness of uh, accessibility of learning materials for students who are learning virtually, who perhaps previously weren't relying on um, you know, text-to-speech or highlighting functionality um, are now finding that that's something that they need to be successful when learning in virtual environments. Um, and so the, the, the push to virtual learning has, has highlighted, um, I think for many educators, the, the need for uh, uh, designing with inclusion in mind from the outset. And so one thing that I would point to in terms of development from the last year or maybe the last couple of years um, would be tools like the Word to EPUB plugin um, from the DAISY Consortium that has made a huge difference in terms of uh, providing educators with toolkit, uh, with, with another tool for their toolkits for producing um, you know, EPUB right from their own materials um, and recognizing that uh, educators are both content creators and um, consumers, albeit um, you know indirectly via students um, of learning materials, uh, and so tools tools that that work to that serve to increase um, uh, awareness and also demand for accessible materials on the part of educators um, and stakeholders at kind of school, district, and provincial levels um, makes, a, makes a big difference in terms of the demand that we see in the alternate format sector for uh, not only alternate format, uh, 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 sorry, specifically produced alternate format materials, but also just uh, learning materials uh, for all students that are designed with, with accessibility in mind. Thank you, Adam. And absolutely, the tools are uh, certainly uh, essential for, for this work. Um, excellent. So um, in terms of uh, the supply chain, how is accessibility preserved throughout the entire supply chain? And in particular, uh, uh, perhaps, Avnish, you could start. What advances have you noticed in the past year uh, in this area? Yep, sure. Yeah, you know, I, all of us know that initial in, in the initial days when we started working on accessibility of publications, the focus was more on the content accessibility. I'm talking about decade ago kind of story. But slowly, everyone realized that producing an accessible having an accessible reading experience for a publication is very different than a website or maybe an audio or full text full audio daisy book because the publications go through the long, long supply chain. No matter you have done your best efforts in making your content accessible. What if your aggregator is not supporting accessibility? What if your retailer is not having the accessible website your, your retailer is not able to show the accessibility metadata and your user is not able to identify which is the accessible publication. What if the DRM used by your distributor is blocking the accessibility? And finally, what if your reading system is not supporting accessibility? 
you can see that accessibility can break at, at any point in the supply chain. And we have to preserve accessibility throughout the supply chain. To overcome this challenge, Daisy Consortium started the accessibility baseline project way back in 2016, thanks to the Google Impact Challenge, which made it possible. We worked on standards, we worked on the accessibility checking tools like ACE, we worked on the metadata and also worked on the accessibility testing of the reading system. Let me take the different nodes one by one, starting from the content. Obviously, standards are very important. If you are producing accessible EPUB 3, EPUB accessibility standard is one to follow. If you are using accessible PDF, you may be using the PDF UA ISO 14289. But anyways, the standards are the starting point. And I remember in 2016, when I was co-leading the EPUB accessibility version 1.0, at that time, publishers were finding it difficult even to put alt text. And we have to relax the requirement for them a little bit so that they are able to meet EPUB accessibility 1.0. And now when we are working on EPUB accessibility 1.1, people are, the publishers are now making the advanced features like extended descriptions like MathML. And they are pushing us to have have level AA as the norm. Just see how far we have come, how far the publishing industry has come in, in, in three or four years. The tools like Accessibility Checker for EPUB, Ace by Daisy, this has been incorporated in the publisher supply chain. And you know, now we are also seeing that retailers and the distributors, that they are also incorporating the accessibility checkers like Ace in their supply chain. They already use EPUB check in their ingestion system and they are adding ACE there so that the basic accessibility can be tested while they ingest the publications. Now let's move to the metadata piece from the content and the ingestion. Uh, we are working on a user experience guide for displaying accessibility metadata in publishing community group, which some of the panelists already mentioned. I think this is one of the one of other big breakthrough. There are two objectives behind this. Number one, we know that the accessibility metadata is machine readable. Even if you will show it to the users, they will not be able to understand it. So we need to provide guidance to the retailers, to the distributors, how to display the accessibility metadata in a user-friendly way. The second objective is long-term. You know, all of us know that there are many, many metadata formats. So no matter which underlying metadata format is used, the user should get the same accessibility information. And this can only be achieved by harmonizing different metadata formats. So over the last one year, we have harmonized the accessibility data of schema.org with Onyx. Many new codes have been added to Onyx thanks to Charles, Madeleine, Gregorio, and Matt Garish for helping us in all this work. And of course, thanks to George also. I forgot George because he's always with me in these efforts. So, and the next step would be to expand the harmonization to the other metadata formats. And let's see the impact. The two big players, Vital Source and Red Shelf, have already started using these guidelines and now they are presenting the accessibility metadata to the users in a user-friendly way, enabling many users to identify the accessible publications. Another challenge was DRM system. I would not like to take the name, but in earlier days, the DRM systems used to block accessibility. But over the last two, three years, we are witnessing the solutions like LCP from EDR Lab, which is a protection system that, that is friendly to accessibility. And the good thing is that this specification is all already submitted to ISO for international standardization. So these are also the great initiatives for on, the, on the protection side, which was a blocker earlier. And obviously on the reading system side, we are seeing a lot of improvements. Uh, in DAISY, we started an initiative for accessibility testing of reading systems on epubtest.org. 
And I would, I would also like to applaud the efforts, the parallel efforts of, of NELS for testing the reading systems which are used in Canada. Due to all these efforts, we can see tremendous progress. In 2017, Vital Source became the first reading system which was able to meet the minimum accessibility requirements. But now, if you visit epoptest.org, you would see that Thorium, Vital Source, Red Shell, Voice Stream Reader are leading the accessibility, and there are many more reading systems who are catching up really fast. So these are the huge improvements that we are looking at in the supply chain over the last two or three years. Thank you. Thank you, Avnish. This is wonderful. Uh, indeed, a lot of improvements and, uh, and great work being done. Um, so uh, uh, drawing on uh, what, uh, what Avnish just um, shared with all of us, um, I would like to uh, perhaps uh, uh, for Noah, this question would be for you. Um, I would like to know uh, if the Canadian market is ready to support um, an, an accessible publishing landscape, um, producing born accessible from uh, content from the uh, perspective of metadata, discoverability, distribution, etc. Great, thanks, Danielle. <laughs> so, yes and no. We're heading there. <laughs> Those are the easy answers. Uh, the, the more, uh, I guess the more detailed answer is uh, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in, in that in that regard. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, some of the work that Avnish was just talking about, about harmonizing the metadata and using standards, those are all hugely important uh, for our, for everywhere, uh, for the supply chain in Canada as well. And they're, you know, they're, they're big, Big, big issues. And <clears throat> so as it stands now, I don't know of many outside of uh, NELS and CELA platforms uh, and, and related platforms that show uh, the accessibility information in the Canadian landscape and the way Avnish was talking about. Uh, Vital Source does an excellent job, uh, a really excellent job of exposing the accessibility. It should be um, what everyone I think should be working towards. Um, and that's our hope, I think. Um, I think that by standardizing some of the uh, discoverable metadata around uh, ebooks, um, we'll go a long way to this. And that's what we've been working on, what BookNet's been working on and promoting and trying to uh, get people to uh, to look at. Um, as it's like, I just looked through our metadata. We have over almost 5 million metadata records, 4 million rec metadata records in our database. Uh, and I do scan through there every so often to see what accessibility is being provided for the digital works. Last year, when I looked, there was almost none. We almost had no um, Onyx related metadata related to accessibility on 4 million titles. So that's a little shocking. It was a little shocking to me even last year. Um, I ran, I reran my query uh, just before this meeting and uh, there were 6,000 titles that had some uh, accessibility metadata tied to them on the Onyx record. Um, so that we know there's way more out there uh, than that. So that's a little bit of a problem, but 6,000 is way better than none <laughs> that, we, that we kind of had a year ago. So or a little over a year ago. So that's a, that's a little bit of a, of the issue, I think too, it's a chicken and egg thing. Um, you know, people, we know people are producing uh, good accessible books, or we're pretty sure they are, um, but they are not describing them in a way that we can take advantage of that in all cases. And so that will go, once we can get that un, under control, that will go a long way to helping the, the discoverability platforms and the e-commerce platforms and the library platforms in exposing this. It was hard to make the case when there was very little data to actually show. Now there's getting to be a point where there's getting to be a lot of data to show and good quality data too. Um, that's the other thing. It has to it has to be usable and describable in the ways that Avanish was talking about. So I think there's still work to be done. I know in our business to business platforms, we're just about to start adding access, accessibility display on the titles uh, that libraries and retailers use on our platform. Uh, so they'll be able to filter on, on different accessibility criteria on the digital books uh, that we do. And we'd like to see other people do that. 49th Shelf here in Canada uh, should do that as well. At some point, they'll get the data from us as well. So, uh, and then it becomes the larger platforms um, 
some of the reading platforms, Kobo, Amazon, uh, library platforms like Overdrive, Hoopla, and others, 3M, need to start exposing this data too. And uh, I'm not sure, I know that there's talks with all of those platforms to do this. We've been involved in some of those talks. So I know that people are working on it, but again, I think it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg thing. Um, you know, there has to be enough to show uh, to make it, make the case uh, of doing that. On the distribution side, I think um, Canada, has a little bit of a, maybe a leg up. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it, but eBound uh, is a huge player here for us. And on the distribution side, they're very involved in this as we know, I know Deb was here yesterday talking in some of the groups, um, you know, they're heavily involved in the distribution of this. They're heavily involved in uh, promoting accessibility and working directly with the publishers to get accessible, born accessible uh, books and uh, born accessible into their workflows. So the distribution piece, I think, um, is there uh, to, for the most part. I think it's uh, making sure we have the data or the information correctly described in a way that can be consumed and then sharing it uh, and promoting it through the discoverability platforms and the e-commerce and library platforms are the, are, the key, are the key pieces we still need to work on a, a lot as well as just continuing to develop the, the content itself, um, which other people are gonna talk about, I assume. Um, I think that all of those things are important, but. You know, I, th I think we are heading in the right direction. Um, it just, it takes time. <laughs> it takes more time <laughs> than it should, but it does take time. But I do think, you know, I'm buoyed by the, by the, the amount of work uh, that I'm seeing out there. So that's, that's really good. And just on the underlying data, the amount of data we're starting to see, like that is a huge increase from almost zero to 6,000. So, um, and that we're, we're not getting everything. That's mostly just trade focused. It's not educational. So other people will talk about it. It's mostly what, uh, what would we consider to be consumer direct or uh, library direct. So on the trade side, I think that's, so we're heading in the right direction, Danielle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noah. I, um, yeah, a lot of work is being done and I, I hear what you're saying uh, about the platforms. Um, yeah, the content is one thing, the platforms is, uh, are another and uh, very importantly from libraries as well. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, your perspective. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, this is mostly directed uh, to Danny. So uh, what, from your perspective, Danny, the reading systems developers need to tackle uh, in order to improve accessibility of their products? And what key improvements would you recommend uh, for them as both a developer and a user of reading systems yourself? Thanks, Daniela. What I, what I was thinking of here <clears throat> is from the end user's perspective. And the, the thing with developing accessible applications is nine times out of 10, if not higher, it doesn't take really any extra work to produce an accessible application. And the longer developers hold out before adding that layer of accessibility to their applications, the more complex it becomes to implement it. So whenever I have the honor of chatting with someone who is thinking of developing something, I'm always saying, Let, let's talk about a foundation that we can produce that's accessible now, because sooner or later, if this app is successful, you're going to want to add it, and it's much better to do it at the beginning. Anyway, um, reading's supposed to be enjoyable. So the reading system interface should be too. Readers want to be able to easily and quickly open a book, find their place, and read it to the end. So that means a clean interface, uh, preferably with shortcut keys to activate key options. It means a clear list of titles to choose from and a simple and accessible mechanism to navigate the book. And perhaps above all, a feature to read to the end of the book is key for all readers. And that last one <clears throat> has such an impact because so many people uh, are, especially with non, or sorry, especially with fiction titles, they just want to just read a book for pleasure. They just want to read through it. And the read to end feature, if properly implemented, has tremendous and profound impact on not only uh, visually impaired or blind readers who want to read the book 
uh, audibly, but also for those with other cognitive challenges, because a, a good reading feature is going to highlight those words uh, as they're being narrated. So it allows them to track the book easier visually as well. So those are my recommendations to developers to focus on, to keep the interface clean, to make it uh, easy to activate options with shortcut keys, uh, and to have a, a really solid read to end feature. Those are the three things that I look for and aren't particularly onerous to implement in most cases. Thank you, Danny. And uh, to think about this from the start and not later. Exactly. <laughs> um, excellent. So um, the next question is for Adam. Um, Adam, as someone who works in the K-12 sector, what do you think would be uh, the impact of a publishing world where accessibility is the norm? Thank you, Daniela, for that question. And to answer it, I'm actually just gonna take a step back to look at um, some of what the alternate format community has presented to this summit in past years. Um, you know, I see my colleague and friend, uh, Bob Minnery, up in my little uh, line of, <laughs> of um, images there. And in previous years, Bob and, Bob and I have implored publishers at this summit to send us into our next career as uh, fan boat captains in the Florida Everglades because, you, because if uh, publishers are producing um, uh, digital accessible, born accessible materials, then you know, there would be uh, you know, perhaps less of a requirement for there to be an alternate format sector. Well, we know now, and we knew then, however, that, you know, some degree of remediation will always be necessary because of the very specific access profiles that we see for among our learners in K-12 and the post-secondary sector. But in kind of directly, to directly answer your question, um, Daniela, it would mean that the alternate format sector, if, if, if we had kind of a, a more born accessible approach to educational publishing in K-12 and post-secondary, it would mean that um, the alternate format sector would not need to be as focused on, base, on what I would just call generally like baseline accessibility um, for educational materials. And so in that way, um, we would be able to focus on more specific cases, uh, specific access um, uh, access uh, profiles of, of learners. So for example, um, if a uh, student who required non-visual access to an EPUB that contained music content, you know, that's something that uh, the alternate the format sector has the expertise to be able to, um, to address. Um, but with a more born accessible approach, um, we would not, we, we would not, we would be producing um, more direct um, uh, specialized, uh, um, meeting more specialized needs as opposed to kind of broader access requirements for um, the entire or close to the entire population of students with print or perceptual disabilities. Um, something that I wanted to, uh, Danny, you mentioned this with this idea of, you know, things need to be appealing as well. Um, and that's something that we've really started to note um, in the alt format sector, alt, sorry, alternate format sector as well, is that um, providing materials that are just, that meet students' accessibility um, and access requirements are not necessarily, that's not necessarily the whole story. They also need to be appealing as well. Um, and so, you know, we've kind of shifted from the, um, from kind of timely, equitable access to uh, you know timely, equitable, and appealing access to learning materials um, for students with print or perceptual disabilities. Um, the, uh, the finally, I'll just mention that the you know in addition to kind of this shift in the proportion of users that we serve um, in a born accessible environment, um, it would also be incredibly helpful for for us at the, at the all formats level, um, if you know more discoverable, like like Avnish, you were mentioning early on, um, more uh, and you as well, Noah, um, you know more uh, greater discoverability of metadata would mean that the alternate format producer would have a better sense of the accessibility features and functionality that were included in a particular title, and so that would be far more efficient for us in terms of evaluating whether or not we either have a legal mandate to produce or 
um, if it's needed by the student uh, or if our production is needed by the student at all. Um, and so, yeah, greater discoverability would be, uh, would be hugely helpful there. Um, and the, the last thing that I'll say um, is, you know, the, 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 in this move towards um, the uh, a greater demand for um, uh, accessible, uh, digital accessible formats, um, the work done uh, by NELS um, with, you know, evaluating reading systems, uh, online resources like those from, from Benetech um, and inclusive publishing, these are hugely helpful because what these do is speak directly to educators um, and to administrators in the education sector um, who can then start to look for uh, accessibility features and functionality in the uh, kind of curriculum uh, the curriculum uh, implementation and procurement of materials. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, lots of interesting thoughts and um, absolutely discover discoverability is becoming, uh, I mean, you just highlighted uh, more reasons why it matters so much uh, to have more access and reduce obligation of efforts. And uh, thank you, this, this is a great, uh, this is great. And uh, the next question would be for Laura. So uh, from your perspective, Laura, what would you recommend um, to publishers that are maybe just starting to dip their toes into accessibility as someone who is really uh, so knowledgeable and has been driving this? Um, well, uh, I, I would say take baby steps. I suspect a lot of the publishers are here have already done some of that work, but in general, especially for like indie Canadian publishers where they have six employees and every employee does four or five jobs, baby steps are really critical to making any progress in this space. Um, and one of the most important things I think a publisher can do, it sort of ha nat happened naturally at the publisher that I work for, but um, to be more explicit about change towards inclusivity when it comes to accessibility and and being more explicit about that might be might take the form of appointing an accessibility advocate somebody who works in house who's always thinking about accessibility and brings those concerns to acquisition meetings and production meetings and marketing meetings and thinks about accessibility um, for the company in a way and brings up those concerns regularly and maybe goes for extended training um, about how to fold those kinds of concerns into nearly everything you do. It should be a part of nearly every decision that's made at a publishing house and having an accessibility advocate makes that more real and more palpable um, and, and also means that it's in everybody's face on the regular. Um, I, I think I annoy my coworkers a little bit, but um, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I would also say like do things like change your workflow by introducing a new script or trying a new tool. Get started with accessibility metadata, like just start. Go to the DAISY knowledge base, which is very good, explains this stuff very well, and start putting schema.org metadata into your EPUBs and put effort into how you use Onyx to describe your books. Um, once you start doing that, it just snowballs and you can see that you can describe your books more fully in a lot of ways. It, it kind of ripples out to all kinds of parts of the publishing process. But, you know, coming to terms with accessibility metadata is critical, I think, to moving forward. But also take advantage of the Department of Canadian Heritage. In, independent Canadian publishers can apply for funding for tech internships. And then they can use those tech interns to write image descriptions, to work on the accessibility of the backlist, to be an accessibility advocate, to help reforming production workflows, um, to finding new tools that will work for your specific uh, publishing company. There's lots of things that can be done with a tech intern. Um, we're using, we have a tech internship right now going on at Anansi. It's just about wrapped up actually. Um, and that person, only worked on the backlist. So they were working on moving things from EPUB 2 to EPUB 3 and then shining up the accessibility of those um, books. We also, um, the tech intern 
in conjunction with the cross media assistant who's here today and we'll talk about some of that work later Matt Chan. We, we worked to get our uh, workflow certified by Benetech. That took some attention and time and some iterations and back and forth with them. I think the certification process, whether or not, I think the certification process is really worthwhile in and of itself, partly because you send books back and forth to Benetech and you get feedback on what's a little bit off about what you're doing and how to improve it. And there's always something to be learned in that process. I think it's really valuable. So ultimately what I think publishers should be doing is taking baby steps all the time to get towards a more fully accessible uh, publishing workflow at whatever form that takes. I would strongly suggest you should start with an accessibility advocate. Thank you, Laura, that's, that's wonderful. Um, baby steps, I love it. It's something everyone can do, uh, at least something that will be already built in and think about accessibility at all stages. Um, so the next question uh, will be for Victoria. Um, so how does the Marrakesh Treaty impact people's access uh, ability, uh, ability to access books? And in particular, what remains to be done in Canada um, to realize the promise of the Marrakesh Treaty? Well, thank you for that important question. Uh, the Marrakesh Treaty has had a really important impact, uh, as I think everybody here would know. Uh, but one of the impetuses from that arose out of the Marrakesh Treaty was it, it gave the opportunity to a lot of countries to update their copyright law and add this provision. So Canada had this provision, but we made it, we, in, in some ways it was, in many ways it was really improved. It is the fastest moving treaty at WIPO. So it, 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 it is a, it's a record and it, you know, it, was, it was responding to a human rights need for access to reading for uh, a, a part of everybody's society, people in every, in, in every society. Another benefit to it is it increased the access in all the Marrakesh countries. So other people have touched on this, but it's allowed, it allows for cross-border exchange, which is really good. So it removed the costly process of, of clearing those rights uh, it, with, with, with uh, foreign rights holders, or even with uh, in some countries, not in Canada, but in some countries of, of clearing rights in your own country to, uh, to produce that material. So that made it, that made more, uh, it has made more books accessible. And the other part of that is that it, it minimized the, the duplication. So that not in, you could coordinate your production. So not every country would reproduce the same book. And uh, so that it, it helps avoid that, that other costly practice of, of duplication of, of materials. So those efforts and expenses can be channeled into the production of more uh, accessible books. It also raised the profile, I think, for people like for people like us who are involved in this. We're really quite aware of it, but I think the profile of the Marrakesh Treaty um, really was able to uh, raise and highlight the the situation with the book famine and allow countries to take some really positive steps to address, to address that book famine. So I think that the, that the first part of that, the question was how does it impact? How does the Marrakesh Treaty impact? I, I think it's a far reaching uh, impact. And then what remains to be done? I think we're all grappling with that. I think uh, similar to publishers, libraries are trying to implement uh, accessibility and the Marrakesh Treaty is really that that tool that it's, it's a policy tool that allows us to um, provide that access and to facilitate the access. So the implementation on the ground, so we have the policy tool, which is wonderful, which is the foundational piece, but now we have to do it on the ground. And this really echoes what a lot of other people have said here is the metadata. We have to, that metadata piece is fundamental. So accessible metadata and getting it to, you know, there's a lot of work that's done, but there's still a lot of work that remains. Um, 
so that that part is is um, is ahead of us. I'm leading a project, uh, a Canada-U.S. project for on with research libraries to implement the Marrakesh Treaty. So to test out, to put in place the mechanisms and to test out that cross-border exchange, because can, both Canada and the United States had sufficient legislation before Marrakesh to produce the materials in our own countries, but Marrakesh allowed us to do this across the border. So we're trying to to do to put this in practice. So we come up against the, the metadata issue and for Canada and fewer than 10 other countries of the 106 Marrakesh Treaty countries, we have another problem. So what I, where I'm working is with research libraries. So what we're trying to do with those research libraries is many of them have the same library services platform. So they're already, there's a compatibility that's already built in to exchanging those materials. But when you look at the Canada-US Canada exchange, we have a condition in our Marrakesh Treaty implementation legislation of commercial availability checks. And the United States does not have that. So when you look at that, so you, I mean, there's some, there's a fundamental flaw in that to begin with, because, you know, you look at it, if the United States doesn't think that their industry is impeded by a commercial availability test, then it really probably isn't there. I mean, we have it, it's a vestige from earlier legislation, but it is an impediment. And I, it's an impediment for the equitable use of those systems. So if you're forcing people with print disabilities to step out of the mainstream system because you have this condition it isn't adding a lot of value because we all know that we all know any of us who have toiled in accessible book production. So I've worked at CNIB for over 10 years. So we, you know, we produce materials. If it's available commercially in an accessible format, nobody is going to invest the resources in making it accessible. So, so when you look at the Delta there, it's really insignificant and to force you know, customization of library systems at that level to accommodate that it's it's a, it's a hard return on investment. And it's, it's, it's going to be a hard ask to work with American research libraries to put, to, to spend money to, to do this, to get your system to talk to less than like, I, you know, the other countries are, are some of them are very small countries, so they wouldn't be doing robust exchange with them. So those are uh, some of the, the, the challenges that remain um, for us. But, you know, this is the, we can see what we can do about changing policy, but we have to operate in the policy frameworks that we do have now. So those are some of the challenges I think that, that, that are, are remaining for us to really fulfill the promise of, of the Marrakesh Treaty. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, certainly a lot of important uh, discussion here uh, that, that should continue at the summit. Um, uh, we are at uh, the hour and I want to make sure that people uh, in the audience have time for asking questions. I just, uh, to close the, 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 this section of the panel, um, I would like to ask everyone just for one or two topics uh, or conversations that from your perspective, we should have in the summit uh, to advance the conversation. So uh, one or two uh, topics, uh, Adam, uh, let's start with you. Oh, sorry, Daniela. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I lost you for a little bit there. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, yeah, just, uh, I just want to hear from uh, all the panelists, one or two topics of conversation that you think we should have at the summit to, uh, to ensure that we continue advancing towards accessible publishing. Oh, thank you, Daniela. Um, education for me in terms of what uh, what's available to, um, uh, what's available to uh, content creators at various points in the supply chain, um, and also just how we can raise the awareness of accessible publishing 
um, and the need for born accessible design um, among all those like among consumers as well because i think a big part of it as well is knowing what to ask for and 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 what consumers should be insisting on um, in terms of their um their um efficient equitable meaningful and uh, appealing access to content Great. so teaching and learning thank you adam avnish okay uh, so everything in supply chain is important, so it's difficult to pinpoint. I would say it depends on the different countries, which is the thing, which, which are the gap areas where they need to work on. From the, from the global perspective, I would say that institutionalizing accessibility in the policies of not only governments, but also in the companies, as Laura said, throughout the hierarchy is something very important. Another observation that I have, <clears throat> I want to make, the producers of accessible, the alternate content have a very important role to play in the born and accessible movement. I am seeing that people are, are, are getting the publications from the publishers. They are recreating it in the EPUB and the DAISY format. This is all good, but you know, this is the same thing that we are doing for last 100 years. So I think the alternate format producers should step up and they should work with the publishers because publishers are not the accessibility experts, but the accessibility expert lies with the alternate content producers. So the, both of them should work together, exchange the knowledge and keep the production the reproduction of the accessible books at the back burner only do when it's really required and help the publishers in making the publication born accessible. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. Hello. There you go. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Danny, um, one or two topics that we should talk about. Thank you. This is neat to look forward to next year. Um, a session on new tools, apps, or uh, accessible reading systems, I think could be really neat. Development is always ongoing on many different fronts. Um, and if everyone's kept apprised of what's going on, we can move forward faster without duplicating work. Uh, it, it's incredible how often <clears throat> uh, a new tool will come across my desk or someone will point out something that is being widely developed <clears throat> that I'm not even aware of. And it's exciting, but I think it would be really neat to share that uh, so that everyone's aware of it. It could also be fun to hold a session on how to actually use assistive technology. So uh, anyone who is interested or producing applications or publications could learn to to test that accessibility themselves. And I think that has two fronts very quickly. First, uh, if they want to know how accessible uh, something they've produced is, knowing how to test that could be neat. But also from a development standpoint, when I work hard on something, I, I <clears throat> am excited to see that actually deploy, to see the application working the way it's anticipated. And if publishers or developers had a way of taking their accessibility features for a test drive, I think it could really build some excitement on, on wanting to advance that and, and actually seeing it perform properly. Thank you, Danny. Uh, and, and very mindful of the time. Um, uh, Laura, do you have uh, one, or, uh, one topic that you think we should cover at the summit? Um, um, the only thing I will say quickly is that I want to make sure that we're always listening to people with a lived experience of a print disability and that those kinds of conversations should always be centered at uh, an event like this. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Noah? Uh, I'll be really fast. Uh, I think that uh, this might not come as a surprise coming from BookNet Canada. I think it'd be really good to have um, some successful business cases, some successful business stories um, of people or platforms that have in, uh, introduced accessibility, born accessible or uh, accessibility focus. Um, uh, we all know that there's a cultural and societal need for this material, but business speaks sometimes. And so is there a dollar value or a success value we can put on the other side of some of these stories? And I think going forward, we will see that. And I think that can really amplify our messages. Thank you, Noah. And uh, Victoria, anything you would like Thank to add? You. I do. I wonder, 
because so many of us are in are toiling in the field of metadata, I wonder if some kind of a concept map uh, session on, on on metadata, so that we know all the different areas where they touch, where they overlap. I think that would be enormously helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm sure the conversations will continue. So now uh, let's do Q&A and Leah will help um, uh, moderate for checking the chat. So welcome, Definitely. Leah. Um, thanks everyone for planning next year's summit for me. I really appreciate that. And thanks for sharing uh, what you have so far. So if anyone has any questions for our fine panelists, you can feel free to use the hand raise feature or throw something in the chat and I will share it. <clears throat> Um, okay, let me figure out how to do this. Uh, Thad. Hi. Hi, everyone. I, I wanted to ask Laura a question. Hi, Laura. You were saying, um, I, I've been watching what you're doing at Anansi and it's fantastic. And I think, you know, great to be emulated. You say uh, this morning certification process is worthwhile, uh, that Publishers need accessibility advocates. The question to you is, uh, you, given that the scale of most publishers, commercial publishers in Canada is so much smaller than in other countries, what, what do you see as sort of a minimum viable organization that can move forward at least in some of the directions that you've been able to move forward? Um, really great question. Um, what I think is that even the teeniest publishers in this country are supported by organizations like the Association of Canadian Publishers, the Literary Press Group, eBound. I'm less familiar with the supports in the French language market, but I know that they're very similar, if not even better. And there's also regional organizations like the OBPO and um, the organization that Heidi heads in BC and Sask Books and the, you know, th there, are, there are loads of publisher support organizations across this country. And they can do a lot of the heavy lifting for these teeny tiny publishers. In a way, for the smaller publishers whose output is mm, 10, 20, 30 books a year, that's even more manageable and even easier to hit targets. It's harder to have the knowledge in house. And so that's where you have to lean on these support organizations. And that's where I, that's what I think is key to making like real advances in accessibility and accessible publishing, especially at the indie level. Does that answer your question? Sure, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I saw a raised hand from Christina <clears throat> of LIA. Hi, Christina. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. It was really interesting. I just want not to make a question, but just provide some information about the fact that. Uh, we in Italy with the LIA Foundation have um, already some experience in the metadata distribution as we uh, create the metadata uh, in line with our certification process. So when we certify a title, we also produce the metadata and we distribute them along the value chain and in an automated way. So if you need any help on that, we will be more than happy. And the metadata are distributed also uh, for the publisher or for any retailer who want them. And uh, they are, um, we also work to automatize the description in a friendly uh, way. So every title has the same description. We don't have different uh, descriptions. So it's uh, also easy for them to understand which are the requirements. So if you need any help, we will be more than happy to, to work with you. Thank you. Excellent to hear. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. We've got another raised hand from Melissa Haken of Demark. Yes, hi everyone, thank you. Uh, so um, I work at Demark. So Demark is an ebook and audiobook distributor based in Quebec, Canada. And, but we also develop an e-lending solution. And right now we are looking at best practices as to how 
to display the, the accessibility metadata in the e-lending solution interface. And it's a big question for us because we don't really know right now what the best practices are. Like, should we implement filters for the users or should it be more of a tags that we should add to the books or on the, the ebook distribution side, we already have the metadata, the accessibility metadata, and we already give them to the vendors. But on the e-lending solutions end, we are a little bit more lost. So I guess we would have many questions on that. So. Uh, I have just placed the link to the guidance document for displaying accessibility metadata. Oh, thank you. It's a very good document, a good starting point. <clears throat> Perfect, thanks. Awesome. Uh, I've got a raise hand from Lars of Calibrio Reader. Hi, Lars. Can you hear me? Yeah. Very good. So, uh, yeah, first of all, to uh, <laughs> to uh, the mark that um, just a, a quick note that you can actually uh, 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 ask for accessibility metadata so you can actually even warn users when they are opening or reading a book. Uh, I can explain more about that later. Uh, so anyways, the, the question was, um, have you, uh, I, I understand that it's a huge uh, effort uh, involved in adding accessibility metadata to, uh, to books, uh, especially to, uh, to a huge backlist of books. So, uh, but I, uh, for years, I've been kind of championing the idea to uh, to crowd uh, source uh, accessibility metadata. It it doesn't need to be uh, of. It can be like categorized as community uh, sourced metadata, but it would be a very good starting point, I think. Uh, have you ever considered it, this? If you have. Uh, then it would be super interesting to hear what you have have you discussed. So that was a question for everybody, actually. <laughs> I can, from BookNet standpoint, uh, no, <laughs> but I like the idea. Uh, we just aren't set up for that in the way we acquire metadata. We really. Uh, look to the publishers to provide the metadata because they're the ones that should speak about their books. Uh, they have the institutional knowledge and, and the people that are involved in it. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't be done at a different level, um, at an aggregator level or or at a platform level. No, um, that no, might be the place for that. And I know that that's done for non-accessibility information uh, through platforms like library thing and stuff like that. I was planning to promote it to uh, to like the Python source and the Medium uh, guys and and everybody that we uh, implement a common set of features in all reading systems um, so that readers can actually uh, engage in this uh, effort. So uh, let's make it happen! Yay! <laughs> so. Please continue the conversation in that uh, working session. Um, we are at 15 after the hour. Are there any more uh, raised hands, Leah? Yeah, there's a few questions in the chat, but yeah, this is, I, I just wanna throw in a logistical comment here. So 11.15 was technically the end of the session, 11.15 my time. Uh, and if anyone needs to go, I know it's very late for Avnish. It's okay if you need to take off, but there, I think maybe we'll take, we can, quickly go through these two or three questions from the chat and then we'll free people uh, in preparation for the next session. So the first one I have is a question from Charles Lapierre of Benetech for Danny. Uh, Danny, you mentioned the read to end feature that is that considered the same as a read aloud feature that we're seeing in a number of reading systems? Yes, exactly. So <clears throat> oftentimes, um, there will be two ways to read a book with AT, uh, either with the, say, the screen readers feature where you can read to the end and that almost in all cases just reads to the end of the document, which is usually the chapter. So that is 
less than an ideal solution because then when the chapter finishes, you need to advance to the next chapter with, uh, with the keyboard before you can read the next one. So it really is a very poor solution. So what we like to see is a read aloud feature uh, that will read to the end of the book. So it'll start at chapter one. And when that finishes, then the reading system will advance to the next document and keep reading it automatically. Perfect. Um, nice and speedy. So then there was a question from Catherine Kelly of the Nova Scotia Public Library System. A uh, question for Victoria. Are any public libraries uh, being involved in the conversations with post-secondary libraries around sharing resources? Thanks, Catherine. Yes, uh, there are. So, um, so I'm working as a visiting program officer with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries and the American counterpart, the Association of Research Libraries. And in those research libraries, in among that group is uh, the New York Public Library, which is a research library. So they are interested in working with us. So we're working with research institutions in Canada and the United States, and also for Canada, because we're a bilingual country. We are also hoping to involve the Bibliothèque the Archives Nationales de Quebec and uh, have been in, in, in contact with Mélanie Dumas, who's, who's also here. But yes, we are. Uh, it's very important that we're, that there's, that, that it's as, in, as inclusive as possible. So public libraries are very much in our, our uh, thoughts. Um, um, I've got one, I, I, I said I'd take the three more. <clears throat> so Bob, maybe if you, you, could, you could talk about that in the Slack or in the chat or in the, in the upcoming conversations or Bob Gibson. But I do have a question from Bob Minnery of Arrow. Question for Avnish. How do, how do you, Avnish, imagine alternate format producers working with publishers, uh, especially educational publishers? Are you looking at publishers like hiring transcribers or having a process for consultation in the workflow? Yeah. Uh, I was coming from the perspective of having the knowledge exchange, the consultancy kind of arrangement. We have seen that publishers want to make their publications accessible, but they lack behind in the knowledge. On the other hand, the Alt, alternate content producers, they have a lot of knowledge knowledge of accessibility. So they, the, the alternate content producers can really help the publishers in improving their workflows, in helping them understand how to write extended descriptions, alt text, uh, help them in uh, understanding the user needs. Uh, and you know, most of the publishing industry, big, uh, I'm not talking about very small publishers, but medium size and the big publishers, they depend on the workflow. If you fix the workflow, then a lot of problems get fixed in the process itself. So what I was talking about consultancy, exchange of knowledge, and maybe certification, if someone wants to step up to, to that level. Thank you. All right. Thank, all right. Thank you, Avisha, and thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a fabulous panel, and I'm, I know there's, you know, probably some more outstanding questions, but hopefully, we'll be, you know, you can talk about them through the next working sessions of the summit. So we do have a break time now uh, until 11:30. If people want to make their way back here for 11:30, then I'm going to give instructions about uh, moving into the the first round of, of working sessions. Um, so yeah, thanks to the panel. Thanks, Daniela. And thanks everyone. We'll be back in a few. Thank you.